I started OWC because it was difficult for me to get to a local store to upgrade my own Apple. On top of that, it was very, very expensive to do so. And it drove me to, number one, do my own upgrades, but share that information and offer these upgrades so that others can benefit the same. I think customers have an incredibly high expectation of us, and that's a good thing. Our customers expect to be delighted, they expect to be informed, and they expect to get what they need and have that thing work until they don't need it anymore. We empower our customers to take their technology further, ensure that the investment that they made a couple years ago doesn't have to be thrown out the door and recycled for something new. You know, technology is great out of the box, but we have solutions that make it better. And even a Mac from a few years ago, when you kick it up to 8 gigs, 16 gigs, 32 gigs of memory, put an OWC SSD inside, connect some external storage, they're better than what you can buy off the shelf new. I mean, it's a great thing to be able to upgrade your system and have these upgrade options available. Reliability in our products is so important and such a focus. Everything that we do leads to the reliability of the product. So we test every hard drive that we put in it, and there are many that don't make the cut. And we test again and check the reliability, and if we need to make an adjustment, we make an adjustment. When you go to plug it in, it needs to work. The cable that goes to the machine needs to work. The power supply needs to work. The drive inside the case needs to work. It all has to come together, and if any part of it fails, then we failed. Other World Computing recognized that there is an, another way, a better way, to supporting the needs of customers with Macs out there. I get excited because I see the future. I mean, we continually take more and more control of our engineering and our design, so our products are truly, really becoming our own and, and unique in the space. I feel like we've always pushed the envelope, but now we actually have the resources to push it even further. Where a lot of people say things can't be done, you know, we're here to make sure they do get done because they're solutions that our customers need and we're proud to provide those. Welcome to DGC Live for this May 27th, 2020. We're excited today to have Larry O'Connor of um, OWC and we look forward to having a conversation with him. So if you have um, questions for Larry, please put them in the, in the Q&A pod. Um, for general chat, just put it in the chat area. But if you do have questions for Larry, let's go ahead and put it in the part of itself. Larry, how are you, sir? Hey, doing great. How about yourself, George? Can't complain at all. How's, uh, how's life at uh, OWC? Uh, it's been different for a couple months, but you know, we're, we're still, we've adapted and we're still you know, cranking and doing so safely. So one of the things I want to talk to you about off the top, I know that OWC is making a concert a big effort to make sure that when products are shipped out the warehouse, that it's safe and it's been cleaned down. I mean, to put it in perspective, just to make sure that when it gets to the end customer, that you know everything is safe and also keeping your folks safe. Yeah, early on, uh, when this stuff uh, you know started to go down, I mean, we made sure that we had masks. We you know, started employing masks way back in early, uh, by about the, the middle of March. We also, I mean, surfaces are being constantly disinfected. You know, gloves were, we have a lot of actually folks already wore gloves, you know, for fingerprint prevention and such, but you know, we employed gloves. site why we moved uh, more than 100 people who were full-time office staff to work from home. And then within our warehouse, uh, spread things out the shifts, started temperature scanning. I mean, we did this stuff really, really early, as well as, you know, giving people paid leave if they or a family member, somebody in their household, you know, and any kind of symptoms. You know, knock on wood today, we've been you know, very, very fortunate. Our staff has stayed healthy. You know, we've kept our, again, we kept the product safe. You know, the data, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, the, the news has a different story every other day on you know, what does or doesn't transmit and you know, how, you know, what the risks are, what the risks aren't. And then at the end of the day, you know, we, we've taken the steps that, that we feel are necessary to keep our team safe and then to keep our customers safe. You know, we, want to, we want to continue to be an essential provider and, you know, it's, it's kind of a better safe than sorry. Oh, for whatever reason, I cannot hear you. Sorry about that. Just want to be uh, make sure that I don't talk over you. So that's good to know that OWC is already making a conscious effort to make sure that you know their folks are safe and the customer customers are safe. Um, I, even, I even add to that. Even before all this, I mean, we have in our warehouse, in addition to that warehouse being kept sparkly clean. You know, our entire operation, we have MERV 13 filters, which take out the bacteria and the viruses from the air and filtration. And we got a big UV uh, kill zone in our system that, you know, whatever you know, makes it to that filter, effectively gets neutralized before the air recirculates. I mean, this is stuff that 
we've done you know, for a while, and certainly after uh, COVID-19, you know, we're looking at some things, you know, future on that are certainly going to, uh, I hope, uh, help us uh, keep our, you know, the flu and all the other normal bugs. You know, that's 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 always something to contend with. I think we're going to be better prepared you know, in the future for those those kinds of you know, normal uh, seasonals as well. So um, we're going to do, I'm going to break away from you a little bit uh, in the chat also. So Dan Montgomery wants to know if you're in a crew dragon capsule. <laughs> I wish. That's, <laughs> that's certainly uh, you know, inspired by today's launch and, you know, maybe one day. I, I certainly hope so. It's pretty amazing what it's, you know, I was able to watch the last shuttle land, which is pretty cool. OWC actually, uh, you know, we were part of the, the last shuttle project, which captured the launch and the photography of the shuttle, the last shuttle, and, and when it went to uh, Smithsonian, all the, the, uh, the, the final uh, transport. And it's really amazing and exciting to see us launching, you know, a, reuse, a truly reusable vehicle that's, you know, far more economical and that's something that I, I really look forward to seeing you know, that final frontier open up. So as, as a company, you, I see you're really taking um, sustainability seriously. Um, tell us about some of the initiatives that OWC is taking as far as uh, wind power, cooling, and so forth. Sure. When we designed our headquarters back and started designing the headquarters back in 2006, the intent was to, to really you know, maximize uh, efficiency, sustainability, and, and make this a building that you know, had the least possible impact. That we could make. I mean, I've included, you know, instead of having a retention pond or a, a really a, a kind of I consider a, a toxic uh, collection area, you know, we put in pavers. You know, we have bio, I mean, yep, we have a bio bed under our parking lot. So instead of stuff that comes out of cars, you know, causing, you know, being collected and, and really being a mess, you know, bacteria and whatnot breaks that down, you know, right beneath the, uh, those pavers. The, uh, the wind power, you know, we put that in in 2009, which at the time provided more power than we consumed as the operation grew and our, our network operations also. We have our own uh, network center. You know, we've added solar uh, in addition to the, uh, obviously to that wind power to, to maintain and, and ensure that we are over 100% generation. You know, we use a, a geothermal system that actually, it's, I believe it's here, 63 or 61 wells that, you know, pump in the, effectively in the summer, I mean, they use the heat exchange and we put heat into the, uh, the ground and into a, a closed loop a well system uh, during the summer. And then the winter that, that heat differential actually, you know, keeps your building uh, you know, warm in the, the winter. So it's, you know, this page barely, uh, you know, scratched to the surface and we're working on a better page and make it you know, a little easier to digest. But, you know, we, I mean, whether it be the solutions that extend the life of, you know, your computer, your other technology, or you know the facility with which you know we build, manufacture, and support these solutions. You know, we really you know go you know to the uh, to ends here to make sure that we're maximizing the use of technology to enable sustainability and efficiency. You know, we're out in the country. I mean, on that uh, on our uh, campus, you know, we also you know, have adjacent to us and owned by OWC, you know, roughly 40 acres of wetland, which you know, we purchased is part of the, uh, the plot for our ability to ensure that it stayed wetland. A lot of wetlands are getting converted, changed, moved, or you do offsets, and we wanted to make sure that that land stayed you know, in its natural state. So what else, what other initiatives are uh, owed up uh, WC? I know you just won a few awards. Uh, do you want to tell us about that? We're talking about the American Business Awards. You know, it's only, you know, we, we're, we're really, I mean, we do this stuff for you, for our customers. I mean, all these solutions you know, are reflective of the needs that, you know, we hear vocalized you know, on a daily basis and especially at the different shows and events that we go to, used to go to, and, you know, look forward to going to in the future. I mean, there's nothing better than hearing from people in the field, you know, what their pain points are, you know, what solutions they're looking for so that we can be inspired and, and effectively develop you know, what that next generation solution is. Sometimes the solution isn't what our customers think it may be, but understanding what the problem is and you know, knowing what technology and opportunities to employ technology exists for those future products, you know, we really are able to come up with some pretty innovative products that you know, step things up and leapfrog over problems that in some cases have been headaches for years. So the American Business Review, I mean, it's, you know, we won an award at the NAB for the Flex 8, which is an amazing uh, you know, media workstation in terms of, I say workstation, it's a powerhouse store solution that also accepts various media, also is a dock, also lets you use U2 uh, SSD in addition to SAS drives, SATA drives, 
it's, you know, flex is for its flexibility. And it's truly, you know, multiple solutions all in one at, at a very affordable price with exceptionally high performance. But this is, you know, these things, you know, working with folks in the industry, working with our customers, you know, that's where these solutions come from. And we go, hey, you know, we can give you something better. You don't have to tolerate this stuff. You know, we want our solution to be there to support your creativity. Honestly, we want our solutions to be, in a certain way, they're boring because you're going to be, you know, doing your work, you know, cranking things away. And you won't even have to give a second thought to, you know, our stuff that's just there, you know, doing its work, you know, Right. Behind the scenes, so that you're the star. So, let's uh, let's go through a few uh, pieces of product here. So, the Thunder Bay, and I say Thunder Bay because it comes in different flavors. So, definitely, folks looking to up their storage game to be able to not only storage but backup, you know, outside also. The Thunder Bay lineup is just a beginning. Tell us a little bit about, about those products. Sure. The, the first Thunder Bays, we began shipping in 2014, actually, maybe the end of 20, actually late 2013. And that's been a, a stable solution in audio and photography and video, video editing. I mean, it's, it's fast enough for 4K. The new Thunder Bay 8 is actually fast enough for 8K, certainly uh, 6K editing. You know, this is a solution that you know, lets you, you know, effectively you know, rate up to, in the case of Thunder Bay 4, four drives, the Thunder Bay 8, eight drives. You know, you're because it's not a you're not locked into a hardware chip. You are also the, the flexibility. And I use the word flexibility again, but you have the flexibility to partition the uh, your drive use. You know, part of your volume can be RAID zero for high speed editing or, or photo scratch. Another part of that drive could be you know RAID one or RAID one plus zero or RAID five, so that you have built in redundancy against a drive failure. You know, you're not forced to use the entire volume in one mode or another. And most important of all is, you know, what it does to protect you and your data and give you plenty of warning, you know, of the potential of, of the drive that's going to go out. You know, hard drives do fail. You know, we do a lot to qualify what we put in our solutions. And we don't just you know, put in flavor of the week into the Thunder Bay and the solutions we build. And certainly we allow our customers in the zero gate configuration to choose, you know, what drives you know, they may feel are best for their need or what they prefer. But when we build a Thunder Bay, I mean, that solution goes through certification and all of our Thunder Bays ship with SoftRaid. And included in SoftRaid is a drive monitoring tool, you know, really unlike any other. Now, there's plenty of tools that do basic smart monitoring. Smart monitoring is great other than it doesn't really tell you there's a problem until you've probably already, you may already have a data loss event. You may have already had a crash, a hiccup. You know some problem because the drive is at a point where it, it's starting to show it's it's not just having errors that you don't see it's having errors that start to impact your workflow soft rate is constantly monitoring you know what's going on with your drives and before smart before a drive has a chance to start you know degrading to a point where it impacts your workflow it comes up and says hey you've got a drive that's got a failure probability it's probably time to replace it now and i love telling this story and i tell that all the time but I, one of our, uh, and this is, I mean, I, I think this company is great, but I won't name who it is, but you know, another uh, kind of a, a you know, friend, another competitor in the space asked, why would you include a tool that you know, may tell somebody that their drive is you know, potentially going to fail three months, six months, you know, maybe, see, maybe that drive is another year or so before it actually you know, causes issues and you know, creates a, a, a data event. And I said, well, you, you've kind of named it. You can't lose data. Data is the most important thing. And just because we may have to cover something under warranty, because you know we have a tool that's going to tell you something's failing, versus you know maybe six months is going to be out of warranty. That's not our goal. Let me just say this. Um, and uh, for for let me let everyone know that that's watching that OWC is a sponsor. But I don't, as a user group uh, manager, I don't really say anything unless I mean it. So I do use Soft Radar. I do have a Thunder Bay. And I do some, have some other RAID systems from other vendors. And one of those RAID systems was filling a few days ago. And I got a little yellow bubble from, from Soft RAID. So Soft RAID is not only monitoring your equipment, it's also monitoring any RAID systems that I have online. So I was able, it was an old RAID, older RAID system, so I was expecting those drives to fail at any moment. So I was able to you know, back up that, that system and you know, save myself the, the agony of not being able to recover. But the soft rate does work, so I think it's an important piece of what you're doing. On that note, also, I just realized that you're gonna 
have a pro version and a standard version of uh, software aid? Yeah, currently we, we, I mean, we kind of are software aid and software aid light, and we're going to move it to software aid standard and software aid pro. I mean, quite frankly, all versions of software aid really are a professional solution. The pro uh, version, or in this case, the, the, what was it, the non light version, call it. You know, gives you RAID uh, levels four, five, and 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 ten. The uh, standard version will support the, the RAID zero and RAID one. And you know something to call out. You know for folks that you know just need RAID one, maybe they're just doing two drives, you know, or just want RAID zero. You know Apple's RAID. You know of course Apple supervised RAID and disk utility for RAID zero and for RAID one. Our RAID zero is faster. Our RAID also is the only software that enables trim on SSDs as part of a, a RAID set. The other thing our RAID uh, one does in addition to you know, provide disk monitoring. I don't know if you know this, but if you have an Apple RAID 1, you will never know that your drive has failed until you, unless you're on disk utility and you go in there and they'll say there's a problem, you have to run it manually, or your second drive fails. Software RAID, you know, because it has monitoring, there's actually no, I guess I'm saying there's no monitoring in Apple. I mean, your system will continue to run, if you have a RAID 1, like on a Mac mini server, something like that, it will continue to run just fine, even though one drive has dropped out of RAID. And software in RAID 1 mode actually doubles read speeds because it does strike reads. It does, of course, a mirrored write, but it maximizes the performance by using both drives. So because, things like that. And as you mentioned earlier, and I know I just keep on talking, I have a... No, no, no we're, we're good. I've, um, I'm used to Larry O'Connor when I, when I meet with him. So the software come packaged with all of your drive systems or just the software, just um, Thunder Bay? Uh, today it comes with everything that's uh, four bays and up, and in the future, you know, that'll probably be expanded. But everything four bays and up includes uh, software aid today. I wanted to say, like you noted earlier, when you install software aid on your system, we don't just limit the monitoring to our own solutions. You know, we provide that monitoring across all your drives and your SSDs as well. So, I mean, we want your data safe. So before we move on from um, Thunder Bays, one of the things I talked to you about a few years ago at NAB, so you have backups, you, you have Thunder Bay that we could use inside our facilities in our home studios. So why hasn't OWC yet have a cloud, a cloud based system? Let's say um, Thunder Bay is attached to Bla uh, Backblaze that we could just back up directly from Thunder Bay. Why, why are we, why, so wh when is that coming or is it ever coming where we're just gonna be able to attach Backblaze to Thunder Bay. It's coming. How to say it, it, it's it's it, I'll just say it's coming, and it, you know, a, a iteration of it, or at least a a partnership that provides the first steps towards you know the, the, the bigger vision, as will be coming this fall. So, and there's a lot more over the next year or so. You're going to be, I think, you're going to be really really happy with what we do with software aid and you know, how to say cloud capabilities, especially over the next uh, couple years here. Some basic stuff, make sure you can easy integrated backup. I mean, that's coming extremely soon. And a far more uh, comprehensive uh, cloud capability is, is definitely uh, framed, architected, and coming. That's needed because, I mean, we're doing a lot of, I mean, because of COVID, we all are doing a lot of work from home. But, you know, overall, we definitely need to have that backup solution. We don't need 10 solutions. We could have one solution that kind of does it all you know, safely, we, we need to be able to push to the cloud at the same time. So let's um, talk about one of your other products. So this is the Mercury Dock. Um, docks are important right now, for, especially for folks that are using um, Thunderbolt devices. Why is this particular dock important? Obviously, you have a few different docks. Why is this particular dock important? No, we have dedicated docks that have more ports in the, the case of the Elite Pro dock. That's a dual drive RAID, so you get up to 32 terabytes of storage. You, know, you can buy a zero gig, put your own drives in. You can buy it, you know, again, pre-configured with up to 32 gigs. It will do RAID zero or RAID one, so you can put it in full redundancy mode, have a built-in hardware backup. But in terms of why it's important, it's a great solution you know, for, for home. It's an all-in-one that gives you, you know, the USB port, the display port, uh, as well as a, a media reader, and kind of the things that may be missing from your, your laptop or, or your desktop, depending without having to buy a separate dock. For a lot of people, it's one solution that gives you the storage, the back, you know, extra storage, backup, and all the ports. Most of the, for a lot of folks, all the ports they need to have a, an effective workstation. I use a per, I use that exact drive, you know, at my office. I, you know, bring, I bring my laptop in, I plug in, and, and I'm off to the race. I got a display plugged in my laptop, I got another display plugged into the display port on that dock, and my keyboard mouse go through the dock. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It means I plug two cables in and I'm done. 
So I meant to ask you, does all of your, um, when you sell a Thunder Bay or one of these dogs, does it automatically come with a cable? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, positively, 100%. Yeah, the short answer is yes. In fact, in the case of the Elite uh, Pro, it comes with both cables, a, a Type A as well as a Type C. I'm sorry, I take that back. Wrong product. The, the Thunder, I'm sorry, the Elite Pro dock is Thunderbolt 3 ohms, so it's Type C only. So, or I, I guess I say when you buy one of our Type C products, our USB products, we do include the Type A and the Type C. Would you say that not all Thunderbolt cables are made equally? I would definitely say that's the case, although, you know, in fairness, and there are some quality differences, and you know, we've certainly focused on maintaining, make sure we we see cables for whatever reason that seem to fail faster than others, and you know, we we steer towards the ones that we know are going to last. But all Thunderbolt cables are uh, are certified, so for the most part, I will say that it's more so with less so with the, uh, less issue with Thunderbolt three than it was with Thunderbolt two. There seems to be a lot of variation. There could be a lot of quality variation with Thunderbolt two cables, but Thunderbolt three is has been pretty uh, pretty solid across the board. If you buy a true Thunderbolt 3 cable, you, know, you should be able to expect, you know, whoever's brand is on there to be honest and fair to uh, to all, that you have a quality product. Don't buy stuff that's not marked. If you're buying US, you know, USB, USB type C cables are a whole other disaster, quite frankly. You, know, you're not, you gotta watch for e-marks. You gotta make sure you're getting certified cables. Those cables can even be dangerous if they're not built right. And they don't have the same thing about Thunderbolt. There's a chip in there you can only get if you're a Thunderbolt developer. If you're getting it otherwise, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a problem and that gets ID'd out and that even potentially those cables can be disabled. There's not much, there's very little contamination in the Thunderbolt stream, but Type-C is kind of wild, wild west and just a USB side. Now, I didn't want to really, um, I was saving this conversation for another, another vendor that I wanted to talk to, but I, I think it's important that I touch, touch with you all also on it. Can you tell us a little bit about Thunderbolt in general? Because I had a long conversation with um, Gary, who you probably know from over at over um, Sonnet, about just distributing my Thunderbolt. You have four ports. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell me a little bit about why it's important? You can, is it six devices per port that you could um, daisy chain? So can you tell us a little bit about, about that? Because that's important to know you know, as far as load balancing, because a lot of us are using external eGPUs also. So tell us a little bit about the load balancer of Thunderbolt. Sure. I mean, the, the first thing is, you know, most, it depends on the laptop you know, and the computer. Some are two channel, some are single channel Thunderbolt. You know, know your computer, how many channels your computer has. And when it comes to a GPU, you, know, you really want as, as best as you can to give the, uh, you know, give the GPU a dedicated channel. Uh, the more you take away from the channel, the less you're going to get out of that GPU. So on a single, you know, you have a, just a single channel machine, you know, ideally that G, the only thing that's other than the GPU with the system potentially is going to be uh, lower end, different kinds of storage, or sorry, different docking, as you say, with USB and then relatively low bandwidth needs sharing that port. So, I mean, there's definitely trade-offs trade -offs and balances to, uh, to be had, especially on the uh, systems that are single. And that's mainly the, the non, mainly the, I think the 13 inch MacBook Pro is the only one that's really only a single channel today. But, Back to the, the port, you know, it's one 5K display per channel. You, know, you can't have multiple 5Ks on the same channel. If you try, one will be black, one will, one, one will be white. Uh, and it is important if you have a high, if you're doing editing work, I mean, have that on, on one side, have your, let's say, have your, uh, your eGPU on the other side. For display, it's not as huge a deal because you already have a big chunk of the, uh, the I would say, the, the Thunderbolt channel carved out for display. Although, 5K can take a little bit more than the uh, than a 4K display it takes across, but it has that. There's 40 gigabits of bandwidth on a Thunderbolt 3 per Thunderbolt 3 channel, but display already has display automatically has 12 gigabits of that dedicated. And I think I'm kind of dancing around all this good stuff, but you know, okay. one thing I say about Thunderbolt versus USB, everything is certified. And the nice thing about certified products, and we've been through this with, I guess I mean we had a, an incredible awesome USB C dock. And it was the best USB-C dock on the market for a couple of years. And then Apple introduced this new Type-C Thunderbolt machines where they decided to change all the rules. And they can do that with USB. They really can't do it with Thunderbolt. When they do it with Thunderbolt, with USB-C, you know, it took us, we chased firmware updates and changes to accommodate, you know, things that Apple was doing that nobody else was doing, by the way, not Google Chrome, not Windows PC, only Apple. And I'm not faulting Apple. I mean, Apple's going to do what's best for their system's operation. And a Apple's an innovator. I mean, they really do find, more often than not, they find the best way to do something. And 
that. You're not going to get the whole industry. Apple can change things. Apple controls their ecosystem, controls their hardware. So every OS update that comes out, you know, they can push a firmware update that everybody's now on and is aligned with that OS. There's really nobody in the PC world that does anything like that. I mean, you buy a Thunderbolt, if you bought a Thunderbolt machine from a PC, for, yeah, for a PC vendor in 2017, you know, a lot of has changed since 2017. And those guys, you know, they're still on, for all fair purposes, old Thunderbolt firmware, which you know, can create issues with, you know, some of the modern stuff. Apple doesn't have those problems, but going to Thunderbolt versus USB, especially things that have you know, complex power management, docs, and Apple's now stable. I mean, I think we're past the point where we're going to have to change every other OS. But with Thunderbolt, you don't have to worry about your device suddenly breaking. If it's been certified for Mac and PC, which all of our products are absolutely first and foremost certified for Mac, if Apple does need to change something, the change is going to be made in a way that doesn't break compatibility or even potentially updates, you know, the firmware that in include accommodation for previously certified devices. You have them, you know that it's been certified to work. Now, on your platform with reliability, with consistency, with you know, characteristics that you know, should be the same every time. With, you know, with USB, especially, in, in, again, I look at the, on the, in the case of UWC and USB-C, you know, we're certified you know, USB-C manufacturers. We follow all the rules. You know, we make sure that our products are specifically compatible with Mac and we work with you know, hardware development to ensure, on both sides and software to ensure that on an ongoing basis, our products aren't going to have issues. You know, that's not the case with a lot of the stuff that's out there. USB-C is wild, wild west. You, you can choose to be certified. You can choose just, you can get away with just throwing some chipsets in a box and saying, here's my USB-C hub dock, you know, whatever. Thunderbolt, if it says Thunderbolt and it's, and you can buy it. Yes, it's, with a couple of exceptions out there, you know, that I've seen uh, how to say overseas, you know, 99% of the products you're going to buy, certainly if you buy it from a brand that you know and trust, it's certified and you can count on it to work. So let me ask you one question about something I've been seeing. There are times when I'm streaming for clients and all systems are fired up. It's like almost my MacBook stopped charging. I know I'm not going to lose power, but why, why does your, your system stop charging? Is that because your Thunderbolt dock is not providing enough power? I mean, you should be able to get enough power going to your system, but it's almost like the battery stops charging, but you're still getting power to the system. It depends on what you're doing. I mean, devices take power and the system, especially the new uh, MacBook 16 uh, inch, that sucker sucks a lot of juice. So once you, when you have the GPU at full power, when you've got the SSD going, when you've got the processor revved up, you know, it, it is very possible that battery goes into it. You go into a, a neutral state where there's you know, all power is being directed at operations. And that's the thing about power delivery. The power goes to where it needs to go. So do we need to be concerned where we see that happening or no? No, I, 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 no. <laughs> No, I, I would say no to that. Yeah, I, I, the short answer is no. It's, it's normal. It's okay. Um, before we move on to, to another device, um, I want to step back to the, to the um, Elite Dock. But that dock just take hard drives also. So if you're going to purchase that dock, just know that you, you're able to put in hard drives into it also. So you put hard drives and SSDs in it. I mean, we ship a standard with hard drives, but it, it's set up to take drives or SSDs. The Thunder Bay, you know, a change we made uh, with the current shipping Thunder Bay is all the Thunder Bays now have a universal bracket that will support a two and a half or three and a half, you know, without having to use an adapter. Cool. So um, this is um, the Helios and one of my uh, favorite products that you have. Um, let's talk a little bit about this little guy. Um, it's, it's a PCI chassis, but you've also have some other tools inside of it to make it into some, I, I mean, look at all of the peripherals that it takes, but tell us a little bit about this doc, because I think this is an important piece moving forward. Unlike the, you know, the new Mac Pro, you know, pretty much everything else that's out there, I mean, whether it's an iMac, a Mac mini, you know, or a, a MacBook, now, we don't have PCIe slots anymore. And the Helios, there's a, lot of pro there's a lot of functionality that you can still add via specialty PCIe cards. So the Helios 3S, you know, first and foremost, gives you a PCIe slot to add that functionality, specific functionality that you need. Now, it could be an SSD card you want to move between devices. It could be a, a USB card, have more, you know, a certain kind of USB port. It could be an audio card. A lot of folks, you know, doing audio mixing, if you buy those the hardware DSPs that you know, have your, your instrumentation, you know, preloaded ready to go. That Helios lets you continue to use those special function uh, PCIe cards that you otherwise would not be able to connect to your system. In addition to that, the Helios now also supports our new 
U.2, uh, I guess you could say a swap module. Now, this takes advantage of the latest NVMe SSD technology, which is in a, it's kind of like a kind of like a two and a half inch drive, but it's all NAND. And this U2 format pattern, this 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 drive type is something that we're really going to see more and more of over the next. It's 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 coming into a mainstream, and this gives you an unlike instead of having to hold or, or swap around an NVMe blade, which you know, looks like a, a memory stick, and it has exposed uh, you know, contacts and whatnot, and is subject to ESD. The U2 module is designed for, uh, for handling and transport inject and how to say insert an ejection. And this system gives you the ability to, to start using U2 drives and interchange them with other devices in our ecosystem, such as the Flex8, where you can be out in the field, you know, transferring data to a U2 module in the Helios, and you can pull that module out, insert it into our Flex, and now ingest it into a larger system for direct uh, data transfer is also great for shipping uh, those modules. And there's a lot more to come with, you know, with that U2 technology. We've got some really great things coming along, taking advantage of the U2. But with the U2 drive, you can sustain speeds, you know, up to about 3,000. Uh, and in a uh, Bethenable about 3, about 2,800 megabytes a second. So extremely high speed, and you know, we're giving you that interchange support. I mean, that is the first uh, solution in Thunderbolt. The only solution, I believe, today in Thunderbolt that lets you use uh, U.2 technology. So this is another one of, uh, I, I like to call it the sister of the Helios. It's not really the sister, but it's the same technology. Um, I really love this uh, piece of device. I mean, it allows you to really, it's, it either goes vertical or horizontal. So you could actually stack this right beside your MacBook Pro. And one of the things I love about OWC technology is I, I honestly feel like I love buying the pretty drives, but I, I want to be able to build my own systems. I'm not building an enclosure, but I'm pulling my own, putting my own peripherals inside of it. I'm, I, I know exactly what's what's going inside of it. You know, I'm able to tinkle with it, and I I kind I think it's so much right now is to be hands on with your, your equipment and be able to know exactly what you're putting in it. This piece of product right here is a prime example of being able to build out your own system. If I'm correct, and I might be wrong, I, are you? Is there a four terabyte right now of um, NVMe that you're offering? There is. Yes, the NVMe is currently got the four terabytes. So with this, you can build a, a 16 terabyte array of all flash. And is that where you think uh, the SSD technology is going or you think we're going to see 2.5 around for, for a little while? You know, 2.5 inch, I think is going to stick around for a bit. I mean, it's, it, we have a lot of systems out there that are still great today you know, that use the, the, the use SATA, I mean, the two and a half inch SATA drives. And, you know, there's, of course, there's all this great new stuff coming out. But, you know, when you put an SSD into a machine, even that's a decade old, it's brand new again. I mean, people are finding lots of uses for you know, laptops that originally, I mean, might have been really slow and painful you know, with a hard drive that are suddenly, you know, better than you know, some of the stuff they might be looking at today once they put an SSD in there. I mean, we've been... Now, before SSDs, you know, we went from, you know, there was a phase, certainly, you know, you go back 15, 20 years, where every time there's a new processor upgrade, we got better and faster. Processors made all the difference. And then, you know, we reached a point where, you know, we pretty much, I mean, the, the, the bottleneck was no longer the processor. We were I.O. bound. A faster processor would make a, a little more difference. And I don't know, I don't know what the analogy would be in terms of having a, a vehicle kind of having a vehicle, you put a bigger engine in, you know, or maybe you can go a little higher RPM, you know, you still don't have a, a great gear, but you can go a little faster on the rev, so it goes just a little faster, you know, when you, you put the pedal all the way down. And then we put, you know, SSDs into these systems, and suddenly they got a whole bunch of higher gears, and now they're shifting, you know, in the gear and, you know, taking off like a, you know, like a, you know, like a race car. So I, I think two and a half is around for a while. We still have a lot of cameras use two and a half. It's versatile. There's folks that, you know, we brought back the Thunder Bay 4 Minis, which use two and a half inch drive, two and a half inch, specifically were designed for two and a half inch just SSDs as a main application. And we brought them back because people like yourself, they, you know, they enjoy being able to build their own systems. In the case of the you know, NVMe drives, you, know, you really don't want to be swapping those around all the time. I mean, those are exposed circuit boards. I mean, you got your flash, your storage is, when you pull it out, I mean, you're, you're touching it, looking at it, it's right there. The two and a half inch drive is protected in, in the Thunder for a lot of applications, especially audio. They're more than fast enough. I mean, way more than fast enough. And especially so if you, you put a bunch together and rate them. And they give folks the ability to swap drives out with these. And when they want to maybe have a set of drives with X instruments, you know, how to say range or 
you know, video, I mean, whatever it may be, you have that flexibility with something that is robust where you can swap drives in and out. So we got a lot of use in computers still and a lot of, uh, how to say, still a lot of demand for folks that just want to want to work with two and a half inch drives until U2, I think, comes around. And certainly in for newer systems, you know, we're gonna, I think we're going to see two and a half and something like a Thunder Bay Mini start to eventually go away once U2 becomes more reasonably priced. But it's like anything else. You know, in, in the case of audio, you, know, you can have, I mean, U2 drives, NVMe technology is much faster than SATA. I mean, it's even in, I mean, you're actually capped by the Thunderbolt bus, not by the drive when it comes to uh, you know, an NVMe drive and U2. But for a lot of you know, workflows, you're already real time, better than real time. You're already as fast as you, you, could, you can't, you're not benefiting from U2 technology. So you know, why, uh, you know, why make the switch? I mean, um, and you and OWC has been been at it for a while with external SSDs. I actually have a box here that my 15 year old toast is the iMac. So it's a tw uh, 2012 iMac. So I'm, I'm about to give it some more life. Put a new. Um, I'm, I'm probably gonna go ahead and put in a new graphics card in it too while I have it open. But I'm about to give it some new life at least for another year or so. So it's definitely uh, your upgrade path is definitely um, warranted. I just so, cut my iMac open last week. It's a lot of it's a lot of fun. Our video is fantastic, by the way, for that. It is it is. So let's talk about. Um, I think this is probably one of your. Uh, I don't want to say bestsellers, but definitely the creative industry is taking hold of uh, the Thunderblade, super fast. Tell us about a little bit about this uh, this guy, and the speeds that it's putting out. Yeah, the Thunderblade, I mean, it doesn't just, I mean, of course, it peaks, hits the 2,800, and, all, and it pretty much maxes your Thunderbolt bus out. I mean, it, it will take every, give you every gigabit, every uh, you know, megabyte per second that your bus can give, and it sustains in an ongoing end-to-end -end, uh, you know, data, you know, 20, 23 to 2,500 megabytes a second, and it's sustained, not just a peak and not just you know, certain, uh, you know, how should I say, synthetic environments. I mean, for doing data ch transfer, doing ingest, for doing editing. Now this drive, you know, truly does it all, and it's got a huge uh, place today in uh, you know, different workflows where data's got to be moved quickly, duplicated quickly, and shipped. It's and you can run that thing over with a truck. I run it over with a tank. And we haven't uh, gotten to try it with a tank yet, but it's extremely. Uh, it, it's 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 bandless. It's extremely quiet. You know, that's a, basically it's a big old heat sink that keeps the drives inside cool, so they're never heat throttled. And you know something else that you know with SSDs coming down in cost, something else is really you know, cool about that product is you know when you have the choice of buying internal Apple SSD storage that's going to be soldered and locked into a system, you know, versus the alternative of buying a Thunder a Thunderblade. The Thunderblade is faster than the internal storage on most of the Macs today, and it's something that can go with you. So you can plug that storage in, you know, put your Photoshop on it, put your video, whatever capacity you need. If you want to go all SSD. It's a great solution, not just now for M&E and for the, uh, the editing, I would say, uh, you know, world. It's also a pretty good solution for somebody who's willing to make the investment to be all SSD today and would like the, the flexibility to be able to move that drive you know, between systems. So I, I do see the, the one terabyte starts out at 729 and it can go all the way up to 4,000 plus, but it's worth- it's 16 terabytes now. <laughs> and it you know, A year ago, the eight terabyte was about that price. And it does come with its own little um, case also for you to carry it around. Correct. Absolutely. I um, we don't want to um, leave out the Mac, uh, the Mac Pro folks. Obviously, um, the Mac Pro is not for everyone, but you're definitely covering the Mac Pro side of things right now. Tell us a little bit about the upgrades available for the Mac Pro, the new Mac Pro. Sure, you know, thus far we've really focused on internal upgrades, uh, both memory and, and solid state. You know, we've, we were the first to take the Mac Pro up to one and a half terabytes very quickly. So, I mean, it's, it, we test, I mean, it's, it's nice being in the, uh, having access to be able to test, confirm, and, and continue to do a test confirming. We make sure everything we ship out, I mean, this is a, an awesome machine. It deserves only the best memory. But whether you want to add 32 gigs, you know, to a base system or take her all the way up to one and a half terabytes, you know, we've got you covered there. And for SSD, you know, Apple's SSD sustains around 3,000 megs a second. Our Excelsior uh, Forum 2, which now goes also, also goes up to 16 terabytes, sustains over 6,000 megabytes a second and is software protected. 
And as an option, you know, I, I do believe when you buy a Mac Pro, you should put at least you know two terabyte SSD in there. I mean, that's just for the long term. You know, how do I say? I mean, it's you're going to want that space. That's just, I mean, you're buying a very expensive machine. I do recommend at least a two terabyte SSD, so you've got that base SSD in there. I certainly, I mean, wouldn't go below one terabyte. And I don't know about going to four terabytes, but whatever additional space you need, you can plug in you now an Excelsior or multiple Excelsiors for even more performance. Uh, up to 16 terabytes uh, in a, a single slot in that machine and get double the performance of that internal drive. So what is your um, overall uh, impression of the new Mac Pro? You know, it's expensive, but I, it's one of those machines that, I mean, I, it, what it does for somebody who needs that kind of horsepower, I think it, the price is justified. I mean, yes, you can build a PC that can do the same stuff for, for less, but you have the whole Apple ecosystem there. You have the whole Apple OS. I mean, Apple by no means is perfect, but they certainly build what I would consider overall the, the best integrated overall solution you know, in terms of reliability, stability, and you know, all the other aspects that you know, have kept us in the Mac platform. So I think it's a great machine. And I think it's a machine that you know, is gonna last, you know, if not five years, you know, 10 years. I know it sounds crazy, but you know, the things that you know, really Hold this back. Well, first off, the processors are upgradable. You can swap the processors so you're not stuck at you know what it ships with. And with all you have lots of Thunderbolt ports, you've got lots of PCIe slots, you've got lots of memory slots. All the things that you know kind of stick in a corner with the MacBooks and the iMacs today, you know, the stuff that's soldered, the stuff that's inside, the stuff that's you know limited upgrade wise, the Mac Pro, the sky is the limit. You know, we have a lot more people holding on to their their Macs today versus you know. I say buying new machines, if they could upgrade their storage, if they could add some more memory. That Mac Pro is right out of the box as a powerhouse and has got the expansion to, to remain a powerhouse for years to come. Video cards typically are the, the biggest thing that you know, impacts the, the usability and you know, it becomes the, the bottleneck in somebody's workflow because there's a new codec, an exchange, they, they need a video card they can support now what they're working on. And you'll be able to put that video card in the Mac Pro. And that's huge. And the good thing, even for all these other machines, you can put those video cards now in Thunderbolt chassis into our you know, things like our Titan, our Node Titan, which again give you. You take a machine that's great that just needs a different GPU, needs that GPU that's got that native codec support, can do the has more memory, can process those, can generate those frames faster. You plug it in, and you're there. So I'm, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing all, all these systems as the, you know whether it's the internal PCI slots with the powerhouses or our, our our machines with Thunderbolt really keep going into the future. I, and I, I agree with you. Um, obviously, there's been, for me, and a, a lot of other Mac, Mac users, there's a big frustration. And I think sometimes we don't know if to be mad at Apple or be mad at the, the vendors that's creating the software. I mean, right now, I do have a Titan that I'm testing here. And I'm running Zoom. Zoom is not optimized for eGPU, but I do have it running on the eGPU. My, my resource numbers are down right now. Zoom normally runs at 34%. Right now I have um, on a Titan and I'm running about 15% on my CPU. So that's a, that's a drop of 15%. I mean, that's what I need. This is a 15 inch MacBook Pro. So, you know, the eGPU factor is definitely a good one. I hope that more vendors really move to metal to try to ease some of the pain of Mac users. Cause I see fre frequently in the forums, you know, there's, there's like, there's times when I'm ready to jump to a PC, but I have a Mac ecosystem. Even if I buy a PC, then it's just one PC hanging out among my Macs and it's, I'm limited to what I can do. I'm not limited, but it's not serving an overall purpose of what I need. Sure. I don't know, I, and, and I hate to, again, I think Apple builds, I mean, really, when you look at the scale and you look at you know, what they put out there, I mean, I do believe Apple builds, you know, from a quality point of view, you know, the best you know, hardware in the world, and they have you know, one of certainly you know, top tier on the OS side. But in terms of design, uh, I do. See, I mean, they went through a phase where it was like I really hate to say it, but it just seemed like it was form over function. You know, the iMac to me just epitomizes that whole you know situation. And you know, they rolled out the new 2012 iMac, which is still pretty much the same design we have today. And the big thing was how slim it was. And I'm like, you look at from the front, it's the same damn machine. Right. You got to look at it sideways to see how slim it is, and it's still just it's still got the same width in the back, but. I use my machine. It sits in front of me. You know, I, 
it doesn't work very well if I sit off to the side to you know, enjoy the slimness. But now I got to cut the screen off to get inside of it. You know, memory is you know being soldered inside, or I got to cut the screen off to get the memory. I, it's the first time in years that I've taken apart an iMac. Uh, you know, last I think it was two Fridays ago, and it out in the garage, hundred degrees outside. I was like, dang, you know, why did they do this? The whole logic, everything's got to come out so you get to those memory slots. You know, more memory put in the SSD, but for more function, and they didn't give us a memory. Why not just get it? How about iMac Pro? You know, memory is, is something that makes a huge difference in that machine, and we take that machine now up to 5, 12 gigabytes. Apple, uh, you know, we doubled the 256 gig when Apple's offering 128. Apple opened up the door to 256. And or I should say, officiate 256 as a configuration, and we went, well, we can go up to 512 now. But you got to cut the screen off an iMac Pro just the same to get to the memory base, memory slots, because they didn't put a little panel on the back. Well, it looks really nice. It's a nice, clean design, but I don't stare at the back of my machine. Well, you have a good video, so I'm going to take that challenge on this week coming up. Um, what I do want to say that most of your Thunderbolt devices right now work with Windows also, so... Yes. I leave the Windows folks out. Um, no, when, I, again, I, I come from the Mac world and I, will, I, I talk Mac centric, but we, I mean, from day one, we actually support pretty much every device we ship on both Mac and PC. And certainly for about the last, and Thunderbolt 2 was a little you know, different. There really wasn't a lot of Thunderbolt. I mean, even today, Windows uh, support for Thunderbolt is not as strong as it is on the Mac side. But with Thunderbolt 3, there's been very, there, well, for record purpose, there has been very good integration. Now with Thunderbolt on PC and pretty much every product that we're, every, I believe every Thunderbolt 3 solution we ship today is uh, both Mac and PC certified, Windows certified. So before we, um, we come up to the last piece of tech here. So one of the things that um, I get asked all the time is, hey, where can I find a used Mac? OWC, you sell used Macs and you sell lots of them. I mean, if I click right now on the Mac mini, well, I, I need to click on the right screen. So if I click on the Rack Me screen, you can actually go in and do a search, and it will give you a, a whole breakdown of what's available in the system. If you click on that 2014, you can even custom configure. It's kind of cool. Well, yes. So the last time I bought a Mac Mini, it didn't have this. You could, you'll actually reconfigure the whole system before you send it to me. That's yep. a Correct. No storage, whole nine yards. Tell the audience a little bit of that, because I think that's important, because... There's so much going on right now for folks that are live streaming. They need an extra MacBook Pro. They might not want to spend that extra $4,000. They might just need something to be able to monitor the stream or just do 50% of the work. Um, how, what kind of care is OWC putting into the, the refurbish, making sure it's good for the buyers when it goes back out? Sure. Every system, I mean, they, they're clean. I mean, they're fully tested. I mean, every port is tested, the display is tested. I mean, we document it in pretty good detail. And, you know, from a grading point of view, you know, we have good, very good, excellent, and, and like new mint. And I'm going to tell you, the, the, the good systems, the systems we call good, you know, there's folks, I mean, that you, know, you can count on the quality. I mean, we're very, very picky about, you know, what passes for good, what passes for, uh, you know, beyond. I mean, even our good systems, folks are like, I mean, we'll say We'll say it's almost like it's brand new. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty crazy. But everything goes through, you know, a, a full system test, memory test of the hardware. I mean, we do a full hardware test and you know, a laptop. Even every key in the laptop is tested. I mean, a lot of time and care goes into actually making sure it's it's a it's a solid system. And of course, you know, the next step, I mean, we pull out the original drives and memory, and, and then we custom configure. So we make a lot of. I mean, for us going into the use space. You know, wasn't originally a big part of the plan, but it, it became you know just a, a perfect fit because we make a lot of the uh, solutions that enable upgrades. You now the iMac, you can't just take a drive out and put another hard drive in because Apple's got custom firmware. You know, we make an iMac uh, thermal uh, sensor kit that interfaces with the SMC so that you can put any hard drive in and it goes in line so that you don't have to do software hacks. And guess what? Because you know we're a hardware solution interfacing with SMC, your Apple diagnostic will still run. When you use software solutions, you end up with fails because you know, you're tricking, you have to do things that you know, aren't quite right for the system. But we go through a lot of time and care to make sure you get a system that's clean, that's, you know, that's been fully tested. Every once in a while, you'll see stuff in our bargain bin where you know, there's a USB port, or we may say there's some, you know, some pixels or you know, an issue, but the units that we offer through our configurator, those units are, are plug and play and ready to go. 
I will say right now, the selection is, you know, the work from home is creating, you know, even if you don't see it on the Apple refurb store, you know, stuff doesn't last very long. And in our case, we've been really working, it's been a real, quite frankly, a struggle to keep, you know, availability on a lot of systems just because of the demand that the current situation has created. Cool. So we're going to wrap here soon. Um, we've talked about the technology. We talked about OWC and the top and your initiatives. One of the things I love about OWC, you're not only supporting my user group that I run DDC, you're supporting all the whole host of um, user groups and folks out there that's doing creative things. You also, you have a, I think you have a water initiative also. Tell me a little bit about that because I'm, I'm very interested in it. Sure, we've done a couple of things. Uh, you know, we support, you know, we've been a long time supporter of Charity Water, which you know, always, I always like to address the, and this is the same with our, any solution that we're getting involved with. It's about, you know, addressing the, the cause, you know, eliminating, you know, the, the cause, not just, you know, dealing with the symptoms. And Charity Water is great because they're, they put wells in, you know, where people need them. You know, lemonade, you know, it's, you know don't, not just about having filters. So after an eight-hour trip, you can tell bar where it came from. You know, they put wells in where those communities are and, and teach those folks you know, how to maintain the well and give them back all that time so that they can do things, you know, more productive. I mean, do it, ed, go to school. Uh, the education, you know, start small businesses and actually start to develop, you know, a village economy that's not held back because they're spending time not just dealing with getting water, but also, you know, the, how to say, the, uh, the issues with water source in terms of parasites and disease and other factors which you know, just compound, you know, an initial problem with water. So water, I think, is, I mean, is where a lot of things start. You give people water, you know, that, that's it, that the potential, you know, starts to unleash from there. I mean, you've got, I mean, that's a foundational a foundational piece. We also uh, were a sponsor. We were involved with the uh, the African Waters Project, which documented uh, sweet water, fresh water sources across the, the continent of Africa, and that's a big one as well. I mean, there's you know, a lot of you know, obviously important importance in protecting you know, that resource and helping people understand that resource because you know, without fresh water, obviously on you know, nature, you know, humanity. I mean, that's a there's, we, we need fresh water. I mean, eco, the ecosystem needs fresh water. And tying into that, we've also uh, been involved with the, uh, the Kiss the Ground project. And Kiss the Ground, which ties right back into water, you know, it was really an amazing you know, look at you know, what truly is you know, a root cause for assuming the environmental change, damage, and, and even global warming. And it comes down to you know, what we do with our farmland and what we can do to change our farmland that's not just beneficial for the environment, but also very beneficial you know, to land restoration and the farmers as well in terms of you know, a better economy for them. It's pretty, I mean, it's, you know, I'm a big fan. I look at a lot of things out there and say, there's just so much smoke and mirrors and there's a lot of good intentions with lack of you know, real understanding. In the last couple of decades, we've learned a lot about you know, what's underneath the ground in terms of the biome there. And I can go on and on about this, but what's absolutely crazy is you know, how much we can do, how much, Farming has done is, you know, they say it, but big business, you know, like I say, that the companies make pesto, like, I'm not going to name names, I don't want to be on a list, but nonetheless, the big ad companies that have pushed inputs, and I'm talking about fertilizers and pesticides, you know, in, over the course of the years to the point where now it takes just not fertilizer, like three times, four times the amount of fertilizer, you know, per pound of, uh, of, of actual produce than it was just a couple decades ago. The land has the ability. You know, effectively to support you know our crops and such. It used to, it always fits on the over. So there's still lots of places where you know you have a proper integration. But there, you know, at one point you know we started to you know, effectively artificially maintain our land. And while that gave a real high, a very beneficial result in the beginning, you know we were slowly killing that land. And it's pretty crazy when you look at. And again, kiss the ground. I really suggest you check it out. It's I mean it's it's a low cost, high impact solution for re not just reversing uh, global warming, also reversing uh, desertification. And there's communities are, I mean, this is, the US, I mean, the U.S. Department of Agriculture even has a program that's been promoting the practices that they go along these, these lines, but 40% of our rainfall comes from our, our vegetation, not from, as I say, the oceans and whatnot. I mean, and, and water masses comes from vegetation. Land that has vegetation on it, you know, creates humidity, creates, you know, effectively creates, you know, rainfall. And you look at, you know, farming, you know, creates microclimates. And when you have vast pieces of land that are farmed, you end up with macroclimates. And you can look at the land loss across the world. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, the farming practices. 
the wrong flight. The good news is it can be reversed. But I go out and there's just water is, you know, I tell you, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And it's, you know, there's, we, at the end of the day, I mean, and that this is something I really believe everybody can, you know, make a difference. I'm a huge advocate for eliminating plastic water bottles. You know, we give out these, our, our, oh, it's kind of invisible. And we give out our, our OWC uh, silver shining. <laughs> You know, ghosts that are already, yes, there's new, yes, new cloaking technology, water, let's say, water, water bottles. I would have to get one of those uh, OWC water bottles. Um, Larry, um, OWC is uh, certainly um, doing their part. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm associated with you and all your great staff, um, Jennifer, Brian, the whole nine yards. I think you guys are doing a great job. One of the things I, you know, as an end user, I love being up at 12 o'clock and having an issue and send out a support ticket. And by 12.30 a.m. in the morning, I'm getting a response. So, you know, there's nothing better than that. Um, we're in COVID-19 right now. A, a great folks like yourself, um, Alex Lindsay, who's a colleague of ours in the industry, is really, he has office hours going on right now. It's been, we just finished our, our 98th show. Um, this morning we had 236 people. So it's great to really have folks, you know, still contributing during this time. And I hope Everyone continues to, to, I don't know what's going to happen on the other side of our industry, but I'm glad you're here to be able to contribute and see, help see us through. You're not only selling products, but you're contributing also. So I, I thank you for that. I appreciate it. I mean, it's, it's a privilege to be here and, you know, we're you know, definitely glad to be able to do what we do. We all share the role. We are all in this together. And um, on social media, everyone could find you at OWC Larry and also powered by OWC on Twitter and you can find DDC. Um, thank you all very much for coming out today and supporting us and Larry, uh, good luck to you and your staff for the rest of the year. Hey, Michael. Thanks, Drew. Yeah, it's fun. All right. No words.